Open your Bibles with me to Genesis at chapter 1. Verses 26 through verse 28. Genesis at chapter 1. Verses 26 through verse 28. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over everything creeping that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may be seated. I want to begin a series of messages entitled From Strong Faith to Stained Glass. From Strong Faith to Stained Glass. The message this morning and in subsequent Sunday gatherings, God willing, has been five years being composed. I want to draw our attention in this series of sermons to the magnificent stained glass which adorns our sanctuary, born of a strong faith from the pages of a holy writ and captured by the vision of the artist who designed each of these windows whose name is Les Wicker. Parenthetically, let me just throw this out here that in his notes on the design upon thanking us for the opportunity, he also mentioned, and I quote, I enjoyed the great preaching I listened to on YouTube by Pastor Anderson while designing this concept. Mighty poor dog don't wag his own tail. From his design concept, there are 10 sets of windows with eight panes contained in each set. Five on the top of the set with a New Testament theme and three underneath with themes from the Old Testament. This basic idea, which I think is marvelously displayed in the mind and design rendering of the artist, is that the Old Testament laid the foundation in principles, people, and prophecies, which find their fulfillment in a New Testament chronology that focused on the life of Christ. The three bottom panes by compositional design are foundation stones that support and uphold what is above them in the five upper panes. Each set of windows is designed with a movement of color that not only enriches the aesthetic appeal of our church's interior and exterior, making it look like a church, but it also creates a directional stream that yet more enhances the eye's natural tendency to follow lines of color that connect in a visual way. The middle window of the five in the upper portion of the set is twice as wide as the four flanking with related symbols and scenes. 
The larger window in the middle costs $8,000. The four on the sides cost $4,000 each, and the three at the bottom are $2,000 each. The first window was purchased by Joseph and Patricia Grant. The second by the Victor Joe family. The third largest window was bought by Humphreys Construction who built the sanctuary. The fourth window was purchased by Sandra Woodard's family. The fifth by Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church. At the bottom, the first of the three windows at the bottom, bay number six was purchased by Queenie Limbrick family. The middle one was purchased by Sheila Burr and the last or the eighth window by Dr. Geneva Johnson. The message this morning, brothers and sisters, gathers around window number seven. Thank you so much, uh, audiovisual people. The message this morning gathers around window number seven, a window for creation with the hand of God coming down, reaching the earth. This theme is particularly apropos in our day and time with the charged political climate over issues of abortion. It should not be lost on any of us this morning that I did not plan this, but it was arranged by the Holy Spirit of God that today is the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, the landmark decision in 1972 that legalized abortion. And I had no idea that this was the 50th anniversary. God just moved in my spirit to preach from this particular passage of scripture because the United States Supreme Court set off a firestorm in its overturning 50 years of starry decisis or settled law in Roe versus Wade, which legalized a woman's right to an abortion. The issue, the issue is seen from the side of people on the right to choose, and then there are people who have a different opinion on the side of the right to life. I will reserve my opinion for a future podcast in coming days, but today let us see what God has to say about human life. Because it does not matter what the right to choose crowd says, it does not matter what the right to life crowd says, God has the last word. People on the right to life side says that babies ought to be born, abortion ought to be outlawed, and uh, that's their opinion, that's what they believe. But a baby is not just supposed to be born, a baby is supposed to be provided for. So if you're going to let the baby be born, don't enact legislation that can't let the mama feed the baby. That's one side of the argument. And then the other side of the argument, the right to choose, is the woman says, it's my body, I can do what I want to do with it. Well, uh, it's your body, but it's God's temple. And God still has the last word. I'm not on one side, I'm not on the other side, I'm on God's side. So let's hear what God has to say. Only God creates life. Only God creates life. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Humankind is the product of God's creative power and not the result of random evolution or natural selection. We did not evolve from a single-celled organism over a million years ago. We are the special creation 
of God himself. My brothers and sisters, all the other animals were spoken into existence by the word of God. A dog, a giraffe, a cat, a lizard, everything created, everything that crawls, creeps, or swims was created by God's spoken word. But we were formed by God from the dust of the earth and God himself breathed into our nostrils and we became a living soul. When the Bible says that we are made in God's image and in God's likeness, it does not mean that we look like God or that God has a body because God does not have hands and feet and legs and eyes and, and, and a mouth. Those are anthropomorphisms. Those are human characteristics that we describe to deity in order for us to relate to God when we talk about his hands and his legs and his feet. That's anthropomorphism. We do not look like God in that God has a body like our body. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when the Bible says that God created us in his image and in his likeness, it means that like God, we are tripartite beings. Like God, we are tripartite beings. In the Godhead, there is Father, Son, and Spirit. In a person, there is body, soul, and spirit. God has intellect, will, and emotion. You and I have intellect, will, and emotion. Everybody God has created is tripartite, like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we are body, soul, and spirit. Our body is the house for our soul and spirit. Our soul, our spirit, is, is, is tabernacling, it dwells, it lives, it is at home in our body. But in the soul, is the seat of will, character, intellect, thoughts, emotion. When you say somebody got soul, what you're saying is they are outlandish and, and, and they are living out loud in their will, in their character, in their intellect, in their thoughts, and in their emotion. But unlike the animals God spoke into creation, you and I are the only created beings who can relate to God in our spirit. Your dog has a soul, but he does not have a spirit. And so dogs do not go to heaven. I, I, I know your little goldfish is pretty, but flush him down the toilet because he's not going to heaven. Uh, I, I know your cat meows on cue, but Missy does not have a spirit. When he or she dies, it's over. But when you and I die, we have a spirit that goes back to the one who created it because the soul makes you self-conscious, but the spirit makes you God-conscious. I wish I had somebody to help me here. The only part of me that makes me, me, is my spirit. And when I lay down to die, my spirit goes back to the God who created me, 
and this body that housed my soul and spirit will go into Houston Memorial Gardens to await the dawn of eternity's ripening. And when he calls me, I will answer because I'll be somewhere listening for my name and my spirit that used to house my, we used to be housed in my body will come back and join my body and I will go back to be with God in my resurrected form and behold what manner of man, behold what manner of son of God because it does not appear what we shall be. Oh, but when he comes, I wish I had a witness. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered the hearts of men the good things that God has in store for them that love him. Only God creates life. Now, not only does God alone create life, but only God continues life in him. We move and we have our being. God and God alone determines the dawn or the birth of a human life. He is in charge when life is created in the womb. There is a sovereign God behind the scenes who determines whether or not a woman's egg is fertilized from a man's sperm inside the womb. That's why he created them male and female. Because what I'm talking about this morning cannot happen with a male and a male. With a female and a female. I wish I had some real men in here and some real women in here who can help me testify that if God made anything better than a woman, he kept it for himself. And ladies, help me testify. There's nothing like a tall, dark, handsome, strong, good-looking, working. Have I got a witness? Because it ain't no romance without finance. I hear you, sister. I hear you, sister. You talking about I don't want no scrub. Riding in the seat of passenger seat of his best friend's car, trying to holler at me. What's your social security number? What's your employer identification number? I didn't mean to go there. Y'all, y'all pushed me all the way over there. I wasn't, I, wasn't even, I wasn't even trying to get there. Where I was trying to get was Jeremiah chapter 1. In verse number five, y'all got me all wool gathered. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you 
a prophet to the nation. You and I are not the product of random chance. We are not the product of good genes or bad genes. What we are in this life is the product of divine sovereignty. Our bodies contain some 7.5 trillion cells. Each cell has 200 trillion atoms called protein molecules. The largest of these protein molecules is called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which contains our hereditary and genetic code. Each DNA is one cell six feet long. Every cell in our bodies contain the exact same DNA information found in all other cells in our body, 7.5 trillion. What I'm trying to get over to you, brothers and sisters, is that every human life conceived in the womb is special. Every person, whether born or unborn, is conceived for a purpose. Jeremiah 29 and verse number 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You are not an accident. I wish I had a witness right here. You are not useless. You are not nobody. You are not nothing. You are not born for no reason. I don't care how you got here. If your parents were married or unmarried, in wedlock or out of wedlock, God let everybody be born for a purpose. God thought enough of you to give you your own set of fingerprints so that nobody on earth is exactly like you. Nobody can beat you being you. You are the best you God has ever created. So walk like you've been created by God like you've been created by God. Dress yourself like you've been created by God. Be proud that God made you who you are. Be thankful that God gave you health and strength. Be glad that God let you walk in here by yourself. Be happy that you can feed and dress and clothe yourself. And no matter what nobody else has, thank God for what you have. I'm trying to move to my last little point here. But I don't have to be the best. I just need to do my best. Because God made me who I am. And with all my mistakes, with all of my faults, and I have many faults, I thank God that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I need somebody here who is crooked as I am, who's as messed up as I am, who's as sometimey and stubborn as I am, who is as mean and recalcitrant as I am, who is sinful as I am, but God still lets you get to his house. God still lets you drive his car, wear his clothes, sleep in his house, spend his money. And since God lets you do all of those things, let everything, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord 
say so. Only God creates life. Only God continues life. But finally, only God concludes life. Only God concludes a life. This is the clear teaching of the scripture. Job chapter 12 and verse 10 says, In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. You are not alive this morning because you've been taking care of yourself. God let you God let me wake up this morning and then God let me get up this morning because a whole lot of folk woke up this morning but they couldn't get up this morning have I got a witness here and since God let me wake up and God let me get up then when I start thinking about where he brought me from and what he brought me through and what he's bringing me to my soul don't have to look back and wonder I know how I got over Psalm 39 and 4 says Lord make me to know my end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. God knows the day, the hour, the minute, even the very second when you will breathe your last and go into an eternity that you chose. You missed that last part. God sends nobody to hell. You choose to go to hell because you refuse God's invitation. And God's invitation goes something like this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The day you hear my voice, Open the door and I will come in and sup. That's an open invitation. Whosoever will, let him come and drink from the fountain of life freely. And if you refuse that invitation, you will end up in hell. Not because God sent you there, but because you moved Jesus out the way. You got to knock Jesus down to go to hell because Jesus is standing at the entrance to hell and for you to get there, you got to push Jesus out of the way. I'm trying to get through here. But, but I told you about Dr. Adrian Rogers preaching in this little town in Kentucky and he was sitting in this little place that was kind of like a bar and a restaurant, a cafe kind of, and uh, this man came to ask for directions to a club called the Gates of Hell. And, and Dr. Rogers said they were not talking to him, he just overheard the conversation. The man seated at the bar said to him, come outside, let me show you how to get there. He says, make a right and you will come to a church called Calvary. He said, go past Calvary and you run right into the gates of hell. I want to tell somebody here this morning if you go past Calvary you will run straight into the gates of hell. God sent Jesus to keep us from going there. Hell 
must be a terrible place because Jesus gave his life to keep me out of there. Um, God knows I'm trying to finish. But, but when, I was, when I was a boy growing up down in Eunice where I'm from, uh, the, the precincts that we could play in was between Ms. Hilda Hayes' house or Reverend George Guillory's house to the snowball stand down the street. That, that was the precincts that we could play in because it was in earshot of my mother's voice. And my mama's hard and fast rule was when I call you, I don't give a what you doing, you better come when I call. So we had to stay within the precincts of Ms. Hilda Hayes or Reverend George Guillory's house and the snowball stand. And, and on, on, on weekends, we would walk to church or during the week, we would walk to choir practice at True Light. And we could go past the four-way stop sign that was down the street from the snowball stand. And on the corner of the four-way stop sign was a little juke joint where all the young people went. I can still see it now with black and white tile on the floor and uh, little bar stools. And my brother Steve and my older brothers would go in there and they'd, they'd be popping on the weekend. I, I don't know if dropping it like it's hot was in style back then but they was dropping it like it was hot. And we would pass by Mr. Bob's place and I would peep in through that screen door and say, I can't wait till I get big. Cause I want to go in there and slow drag on the Isley Brothers. I can still hear Gladys Knight saying, I'm leaving. Come on, help me sing that. On the midnight train to Georgia. Now y'all trying to act all spiritual like y'all don't know that. I wanted to get in Mr. Bob's place so bad because their dress tails was just swinging from side to side. But my brother Steve would never let us go in there. Every time we looked in Mr. Bob's place, Steve was standing at the door to make sure we didn't go in. Can I help somebody right here? I would go to hell and be the biggest fool in Houston that you will ever find. But somebody, my elder brother, is standing at the door to keep me from going there. Because he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Not somewhere like this, but a place for you that where I am, there you will be also. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Brothers and sisters, death may come through tragedy, disease, or old age. Sometimes, sadly, or after a long chronic illness. But however we leave this world, God's will determines the when, the where, and how. What I've been trying to say in this little message on this anniversary of Roe versus Wade, I'm not on the side of the right to life people, I'm not on the side of the right to choose people. There are arguments pro and con on both sides. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That Bible says and the Bible teaches that life is so precious that God sent his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. You're going to help me close here, won't you? 
I want you to look with me now one more time at these windows. And I want to thank God for window number one with the name of Joseph and Patricia Grant. Brother Grant is in his grave, but thank you, Sister Grant. Window number two is Victor Joe and his family. Thank you, Victor, for your contribution. Thank you, Humphreys Construction, for that middle window where Mary is holding the baby Jesus. Thank God for Sandra Woodard's family with that window on the other side. And thank God for Lily Grove with that last window in the first set of windows. At the bottom, there's a window bought by Queenie Limbrick. Thank you, Sister Limbrick and your family for your contribution. Thank you, Sheila Burr, for that window of the hand of God creating the heavens and the earth. Thank you, Dr. Geneva Johnson, for that tree of life in the last window over there. If you've been staying with me, I've been calling some names. Names like Joseph and Patricia Grant. Names like Victor Joe and Humphreys Construction. Names like Sandra Woodard and Lily Grove Church. Queenie Limbrick and Sheila Burr. Another name like Dr. Geneva Johnson. And I'm going to call some more names next Sunday in the second set of windows. But I'm not shouting this morning because of Joseph and Patricia Grant. I'm not shouting because of Victor Joe and Humphreys Construction. I'm not glad this morning because of Sandra Woodard and Lily Grove. Thank God for Queenie Limbrick and Sheila Burr. I'm not really excited over Dr. Geneva Johnson and her contribution. But there is a name that is above every name. Not Joseph and Patricia Grant, the name Jesus. Not Victor Joe, but the name Jesus. Not Humphreys Construction, but the name Jesus. Not Sandra Woodard, but the name Jesus. Not Lily Grove, but the name Jesus. Not Queenie Limbrick, but the name Jesus. Not Sheila Burr, but the name Jesus. Not Geneva Johnson, but the name Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. Is there anybody here know the name I'm about to call? Not Joseph Grant's name, not Queenie Limbrick's name, not Sandra Woodard's name, not Humphrey's construction name, but there is a name that soothes my sorrow. There is a name that dries my tears. There is a name that picks me up when I fall. There is a name that rocks me when I get weary. There is a name that makes me happy every time I hear it. Jesus, in the morning, come on, help me call that name. Jesus, at noonday, help me call that name. Jesus, in the midnight hour, there's power in that name. There's joy in that name. There is deliverance in that name. There is love in that name. There's salvation in that name. If you know his name and you're not ashamed to testify. If he brought you out and you don't care who's looking at you. If he made a way and you don't mind testifying, help me call that name. Jesus, 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 I love your name. 
Jesus, I worship your name. Jesus, I exalt your name. Jesus, I honor your name. Jesus, y'all know him, don't you? If you don't know him, let me testify a minute. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. He's a friend when you're friendless. He's bread when you're hungry. He's water when you're thirsty. Y'all know him, don't you? He's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's ark. He's Moses' bush on fire. Y'all know him, don't you? He's Joshua's battle axe. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Samson's power. He's David's music. He's Solomon's wisdom. He's Jeremiah's balm. He's Ezekiel's wheel. In the middle of a wheel, he was born in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth. He died, didn't he die? But early Sunday morning, he arose, didn't he rise? I need a witness who don't mind calling that name. Why don't you look at somebody? Tell them that's power in that name. Come on, look at somebody else. Tell them I wish you could know him like I know him. I wish Reverend would give me time this morning. I would talk about where he brought me from. He brought me. He kept me. He raised me. He saved me. He never left me. He's been good to me. He's been a mother for me. He's been a father for me. He's been a doctor for me. Do you know him? Have you tried him? Won't he work it out? Won't he turn it around? Tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. is over. He's coming back to receive me to himself. Are you going with me? I said, are you going with me? Why don't you shake somebody's hand? Tell them if you miss me from singing down here, you can't find me nowhere. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. I know he's all Only God, only God creates life. Job said, the Lord gives, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because only God can give life. And then only God can continue life. And then only God knows the day, the hour, the minute, the second that I'm going to breathe my last breath. 
So I'm going to say like my mama said. I'm going to live as long as I can and die when I can't help it. Because God gave me this life and I'm not going to let you tell me what to do with it. Don't let anybody bury the light of your potential under the bushel of their expectation. God made you to be the best you that you can be. It may not please somebody else. Let them walk. Let them go. Unfriend them. Because the folk who are going to love you are going to love you regardless. And the folk who don't love you didn't love you to start with. You ain't going to miss what you never had. But if you put your hand in God's hand as our brothers stand this morning, as our evangelism people get in the aisles, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with the God who made you, you can get that straight this morning. If you don't have a relationship, if, if you are not in fellowship with the God who made you, come on right now. Praise God. I see you coming. That's right. Somebody else is here. You've been thinking about it been on your heart, it's been on your mind, don't put it off another week. Just do it now. Praise the Lord. I love you sing this word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name See, that's right. better than anybody else, you know whether or not you are in a right relationship with God. And my relationship with God is not based on how I act or how I talk or how I look. My relationship with God is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That he died for my sin and I applied that blood to my heart. I trust that what God did for me in Jesus one Friday is enough to save me. And the Bible says, not only does he save, but he saves to the uttermost. 
so that no matter what I do from now on, I will never be lost. Let me say that one more time. From now on, because I have trusted Jesus as my Savior, I will never be lost. I can be manipulated by the devil. I can be motivated by the devil, stimulated by the devil, and activated by the devil. But there's one thing the devil will never be able to do to me again, and that's occupy the throne of my heart. Because somebody already lives there. And that person is Jesus Christ. You're not saved. You're not going to heaven because you're Catholic. You're not going to heaven because you're a good Baptist. You go to heaven because you have trusted God's invitation to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Stop trying to be good. You're never going to accomplish that because it's not in you we were born in trespasses and sins and in sin what we can see so for you to try to live right and act right you can't do it without the enabling of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will only indwell somebody who knows the son who's connected to the father he that hath the Son has life, but he that hath not the Son has not life, and the wrath of God abideth upon him. All of us are sinners saved by the grace of God. And when I say sinners, I mean many of us, Terry included, has sinned since I've been saved. But I don't lose my salvation when I sin. But the scripture says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I, I've, I've told you this before, so this won't come as a shock to you. Whenever the Powerball or the Mega Million is all, you know, like 800 million or a billion dollars. I go way on the north side of town and put on some dark shades and, 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 and go up to the counter. And this is what happens every time. Pastor, is that you? I said, I was looking for some Sprite. Y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all don't. I, I've, I've sinned twice. I lied about the lottery ticket. And then I lied talking about I was looking for some, I wasn't looking for no Sprite. I thought nobody knew me over on the north side. I think I want to get off of YouTube and Facebook and all of that. It's, it's, it's cutting into my little situation. But, but, but we have an advocate with the Father, the man Jesus Christ. That whatever your sin is, it doesn't have to be my sin, whatever your sin is, if you bring it to God, he is faithful to forgive you. Why don't you do it today? Don't put it off another Sunday. Don't stop thinking about it. You've been thinking about it long enough. That's why you're in the shape you're in, because you've been thinking about it. Let God have it. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. He calls me Come on, let's say it again. Somebody's still thinking about it.
divine invitation has been extended to you and as always it is yours either to receive or to reject. Let's thank God for these who have joined our congregation this morning. <laughs>